come up again later. And of course, because these signals, these random signals here, as so I'm writing that with a capital letter rather than a small letter, uh, are baseband signals, I can write them, I can sample them at the Nyquist rate, and then I can represent this signal as a sum of samples times the sync function, right? Taken at appropriate intervals. And so suppose that we transmit over t seconds, then there will be the bandwidth times t symbols. And so I, I've written this, the signal at terminal t can represent, be represented by a discrete, vec discrete time vector now from x of 1 to x of n. And I should remark that the baseband representation of the signal, this can be a comp this is a complex um, time signal, right? Because we're moving things from baseband, uh, from past band down to baseband. Finally, um, if there are, if we transmit in two seconds, then the energy of the signal is just the sum of the samples, and we're going to restrict that to be less than n times times some power constraint. So nothing surprising here, just the basic assumptions. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about the received signal. Uh, I have to choose the model. Um, I, I already, well, actually, I guess I already did. I said it was the noise plus um, no intersymbol interference, so something that could vary with time. That's why it has an index i here. Uh, and this gets multiplied then by the transmitted signal I'm summing over all other terminals, and that's the signal that then appears at terminal t. And I'm also going to uh, choose a, um, a, a hybrid model that has both a deterministic part and a random part. The deterministic part has to do with uh, path loss. I'm going to me measure that there's a distance, and I'm going to rate between terminal s and t and raise that to an attenuation exponent divided by 2. And this gets multiplied by some random channel gain, which may be due to fading or some other phenomenon maybe even put in deliberately, for instance. And the noise here is independent, identically distributed, proper, meaning circularly symmetric, complex scale noise with unit variance. So I can write the channel, because I had a linear channel model to begin, to, before to begin with, I can write this now as a discrete time uh, linear channel because I have, everything is in base band. The types of random models I'm going to choose, I'm going to use are of two kinds. So I'm going to talk about no fading. So that this is the case. If this happens, I'm going to assume everyone knows what the channel coefficients are, and they're all unity. And the second type of channel model, and, I, and it, this incorporates um, sort of the basic properties that uh, some of the basic, uh, the most important basic property I need to use to make some information theoretic statements. And that is that this h now is a random variable which varies, which is e to the j theta, where theta, the theta are iid and uniform over 0 to 2 pi. So what that means is the paths, any path between terminal, one terminal s and another terminal t varies at random every time interval. So you're not considering amplitude fading? I'm not going to consider amplitude fading. Now, there's a very specific reason for that. This is simpler to deal with. And one particular thing I want to say that already appears with the phase fading only. So any process, including Rayleigh fading, for instance, that has this random phase fading will exhibit a certain type of property I'd like to show you later. And, and it, basically, it's, you can actually achieve capacity for some situations, the information theoretic capacity. And that's what's interesting about that. So without amp amplitude fading, will we'll complicate the theory because you have to add an extra integral. So I just want to get rid of that. Um. I'm a little confused by, I mean, puzzled by the choice of alpha over 2 as the exponent. So inverse square corresponds to alpha 4. Uh, uh, yes, but remember, this, this is not power. This is voltage. It's voltage. Oh, oh voltage. I see. Yeah. That's why. The divide by 2. So uh, free space would be alpha is 2. It's free space. Alpha. Okay. Uh, just for... Just as a short remark, I don't think it's going to be so important that I'm going to point out things anyway, but I'm going to change the notation a little, just a little bit to make it a little less clutter as we go along. But you don't have to worry about that too much. Any questions about that part? I think it's pretty straightforward, I hope. Uh, no surprises. I have one page here uh, to say a little bit about information theory. Uh, you all know about that, I saw already. But I think I'll just walk through it just so you see the type of notation I'm using. So uh, the most, one of the most important results in information theory, as you 
Now was by Claude Shannon in 1948. And the type of problem he was looking at is shown here. And this is basically his figure one of his paper. So what we have is a source. And the source I'm going, the type of sources I want to consider are message sources. So they consist of B bits. The encoder maps those bits onto the sequence of input symbols into a channel. And these are usually n complex numbers. Channel maps those input symbols into output symbols, which are again complex numbers, and then a decoder maps those output symbols onto an estimate of the message bits, which is hopefully the same as the message bits of that game. So the problem he posed was to find the largest rate, which is the number of bits divided by the number of channel uses, for which we can make the block error probability go to zero as the block length goes to infinity. And this rate is called the capacity. And he further showed that for any choice um, for any choice of random variable x here, so the channel is a conditional probability distribution, for any choice of random variable x, if I compute the mutual information between a one-shot input and a one-shot, that corresponding one-shot output, and that mutual information is given by the entropy of the input minus the entropy of the input given what the receiver observes, then I can achieve that rate. Uh, by no means an obvious result, because after all, we're putting n input symbols into a channel and we're getting n symbols out. Why should we be able to characterize this number by just one use of the channel? But in fact, one's able to do that. And he also further showed that, so he showed this was achievable. And furthermore, if we maximize over all random variables at the input x, subject to the alphabet constraints or perhaps some other constraints, uh, if we maximize that mutual information, that gives us the capacity, what we call the capacity of the channel, the maximum rate at which we can transmit reliably through in the busy channel. Okay. And this is so simple, basically because the channel is memoryless, right? One input symbol affects only one input symbol. If there was memory, things get quite already good stage more complicated. Everyone clear on that? Okay, good. So let's move, let me move then to uh, more specifically uh, starting to put these two things together. So suppose I uh, consider, I'd like to consider relay channels and what, how we should code for these channels. And to do that, I'd like to consider the simplest kind of relay channel. And the simplest kind is one that has one relay. I've numbered the terminals here from one for the source, two to the relay, and three for the destination. And uh, I'm going to assume every terminal has a transmit waveform. It might be a vector waveform, so there could be Nemo if you liked, but I'm just going to write this as the input of the source is x1, the input of the relay is x2, the output of the relay that what the relay sees is the signal y2, and the, what the terminal 3 sees is the signal y3. They're all band-limited signals, so I can represent them as discrete time samples. And it does not matter, by the way, whether these, are, these signals are synchronized or not. I can always still do this, right? But I will be assuming certain timing offsets in order to, do, to represent these appropriately. But we'll get back to that a little bit later. And the problem here now is, as for the uh, previous page, to find the largest rate, which is the number of bits of a message at the source, divided by the number of channel uses for which we can make the block error probability go to zero as n goes to infinity. And what's interesting about this problem is that it's still open. Even for Gaussian channels, this is still an open problem. And even for simple Gaussian channels, which uh, I'm going to talk about. So let's get a little more specific. I want to draw out the model exactly. Let's look at Gaussian channels. So more specifically, what was inside, here's the channel. So inside this circle is basically a conditional probability distribution function. That's what a channel is. And the way this works is that the relay's output signal at a certain time is the Sources input signal multiplied by a uh, path, the path loss, and a fading random variable plus Gaussian noise, and then we get, say, the i output symbol. The relay sees the symbol with a small delay, that's just for practical purposes, and can use all past observations to encode to generate the i output. So I've written that here. The i input to the channel of the relay is any function so that's indexed by time too, so it can change with time of all the past outputs. 
And of course, the I's input of this guy is just some function of all the message bits. And then what the receiver sees at time i is some uh, scaled linear combination uh, or a linear combination of scaled versions of the source input and the relay input plus noise. Right? And it can collect all values, its output values before mapping those values to a decoded message. Why is also divided by two? Because uh, we're looking at voltage here, not, not power. So one one interesting thing of this, about this picture is if you look at it, actually, if you if you model this channel like this, and that's it, you're actually permitting full duplex transmission by the relay, right? The relay at every time sees something and can transmit, and we'll get to that constraint a little bit, uh, or I guess I'll get to it right now. <laughs> so the, the the next question to ask is, well, suppose we do have relays and we want to model this a little bit more carefully. Most uh, practical devices that you can buy cannot receive and transmit at the same time, mainly because the signal that is being received is so much weaker than what is being transmitted. It might be 60 dB or even more of the differences in, in power level. And so it's, it, it's very hard to, to keep these two paths, these two paths, the one going out and the one coming in, to keep those apart. In the same bandwidth, right? In the same bandwidth, yes. So one potential, one, one potential thing one can do is A, divide up the frequency, or B, divide up the time. And you're basically doing the same thing, right? So it's orthogonalization. The question really is, is that the best thing to do or not? And we'd like to know that. Because I'd like to look at this problem from an information theoretic perspective. And uh, probably doing it in time is more practical than frequency, especially, uh, well, you know, it's a matter of flexibility and building filters, of course. Sorry, just to double check, you said that delay there is meant to yeah. be small, like uh, much, much shorter than the message, right? But it's supposed to be here basically one symbol. One symbol, yeah, exactly one symbol. Uh, it, it, it could be more, and that won't play a role for our capacity calculations. That doesn't play an important role. What's only important is that the delay is finite, and the easiest one to choose is one symbol. So let's go to the half duplex uh, devices. Basically, uh, there's a simple fix to the model to make it half duplex, and importantly, to keep the channel memoryless. That's very important to me because the, the theory I'm going to show you applies to memoryless channels. So I'd like a memoryless channel model for half duplex devices. And the new channel, well, it's not too hard. What you can say is, well, what we can say is if the uh, relay, uh, or if a relay is transmitting zero, so nothing, then it will receive the Y we've defined before. And if it is transmitting anything else, we will say, well, it doesn't get anything. Or, or zero, or this might be any constant. It could be 100, 200, it doesn't matter. It's just some number that's fixed. Okay, that's the model. That's the change, very simple. And with this change, the channel is in fact still memoryless because I can write it as P Y1, Y2, given X2 and X3, right? Because I have the given X2 in the conditioning. So T is the index for what? A T is the index for the ter uh, terminal. So if at the relay, this would be a 2. T so would be terminal. Yeah, terminal 2, the relay terminal. And I is index for time. And this is the linear combination of signals, and this is just the modification to take the half duplex constraint into account. And my main, perf main point I want to say is this is a memoryless model for half duplex devices. Now, I can, I can make this model a little bit more refined, and I'm going to do that by adding an abstraction. And I think you'll see that, I think I can convince you pretty easily that this is going to be the same. There's some reason I'm doing this. It's going to make the theory a little bit clearer. Suppose I, mo I, I, I change this model just a little bit, and I add a new random variable, namely something called the mode random variable. So the M2 here is a random variable that represents what the relay is doing, and I'm going to assume that it's going to be in one of three modes, either sleep, listen, or talk. Actually, I only need listen or talk, but I sleep gave a nicer acronym, so I added sleep. And often in many in practice devices do sleep, listen, or talk, so that's a second reason. Is this like a state? Uh, if you like, it's a state, yes. Um, uh, many people call it a mode, and I kind of like the name, so I chose mode. Yeah. So if, if M2, the random variable, takes on the value sleep or S, then We'll have, we'll, I'm going to say, well, the relay is going to transmit nothing and receive nothing and consume very low power. If the RAN variable M2 takes on the value listen, um, the, the relay doesn't transmit but receives and consumes a certain amount of power due to amplification and processing. 
If the mode M2 takes on the value T, then um, the relay doesn't receive anything, and there's a certain power consumed that is a function of the input. Right. Just the very natural stuff. Uh, uh, another thing that m might be interesting to add is to add a mode power constraint. So if you are in a certain mode, you can consume only a certain amount of power. And the reason for adding this is, suppose you didn't have this, and suppose your relay listens almost all of the time and then had an opportunity to talk, well then it could just boost up its power to some huge value, which might be unrealistic. So that's the reason for adding a per mode power constraint. Any questions about that? So uh, I'm going to use two equivalent models for active flex device, and simply this one, which is already memoryless, or I'm going to add this mode. I'm going to use something that looks like this, where I have a, another extra random variable called the mode at the relay. And that's going to play a very important role in, in a point I want to make later on, that mode random variable. Is that relatively clear, though? If that is also yeah. memoryless? Uh, uh, um, well, this certainly is memoryless. Um, in building in this mode, I, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a channel P of w Y. Maybe I'll write it here. Uh, here. Yeah, that's fine. So before I had a, a channel model which looked like this, the output at terminal 2, the relay, and at terminal 3, the destination, give the input at the source and the input at the relay. And now I'm going to add a random variable. And, and this channel has been this built into it. That's my, you can, I can do that with the memory list model. Now I'm going to add a mode M2 to the whole picture, a new random variable. And I'm going to assume that the, of course, the relay can do something with that, right? So it's just this. And I'm just going to, if, if M2 is, you know, sleep, then I'm going to confine X2 to take on certain values. So basically, what's going to happen, and I'll show that later, this is going to be the new input of the relay. It's an abstraction. The actual input of the relay is this, but I'm going to just make it this. I'll show you how to do that, but yeah, it'll still be your own. And the, the, again, the important thing with memory lists is I can apply all the theory that's out there already for relay channels. That's the whole point of trying to model this properly. And uh, just as an opinion, I, th I think this model really does capture what these devices can essentially do. In addition to having power constraints, they can turn on and off. Right. And then to end the fraction of the cooler that you're on for, yes. or in one of the modes, right? Yeah, this is the number of times the relay is in mode, yeah. a certain mode, like say sleep. So I'll have a sleep power constraint and so forth. Or actually, the most important one, I guess, is really talk, because that's where we measure something going to be transmitted. So, let me talk now about communication strategies. And I'd like to talk about two kinds of strategies in particular and distinguish the two. Um, a natural strategy to use for half duplex relays, and the one I've seen in all papers on the subject that actually have half duplex relays in them, is to do the following. You plan ahead. You plan what time. You allocate fixed time slots for the modes. So what, what you do is, suppose that in our model right now, the source always transmits, the destination always listens, so this is time. And we, we, we plan ahead. We tell everyone in the system when the relay is listening, talking, and sitting. And hopefully the relay listens before it talks. Okay. That's why I think. And um, so the important, I'm going to call this a fixed or deterministic slot strategy, since everyone in the system always knows this mode. Right? Everyone in the system. Uh, to I'd like to distinguish this class of strategies with the following one. Suppose, only, suppose the source knows the mode, but the destination does not. Suppose we don't tell the destination that ahead of time. Well, then this, a good strategy might look like something like this. The relay first listens, then talks, then sleeps, and talks, sleeps, listens. In other words, it, it is turning on and off at, at a, in some way which the destination does not know. It's just a different class of strategy. And when you look at this at first, and this happened to me too, I was looking at this and I, think, I was thinking, well, I, I, I think this kind of strategy should be best, actually. It's just, to get, you know, you have extra information available, you can control things better, and so forth. Let's see. Okay, the next thing I'd like to go to, so keep those two in mind. 
The next thing I'd like to go to is the information theory. Quick question. Yeah. Quick question. Uh, you introduced the sleep model kind of for completeness. Isn't it optimal to never sleep or to relate to never sleep? Um, I mean, is it optimal? Yeah. It, it, depends. It, it, it depends on your constraints. I'm going to put things in like that. Suppose the, the relay has a, has a solar cell. It might want to sleep to gather power. Depending on if how much, if there's more power it can gather through the solar cell and it needs it, you know, during certain times, it might be useful to sleep. So it depends on the it, it constraints. Depends, it depends on the constraints of the system. But the real uh, um, the real reason I added the sleep mode was for aesthetics, right? I like I like a nice strategy. I, I like a nice acronym. <laughs> and SWOT strategy sounds nicer than WAT strategy. So, very simple. The solar cell constraints to your remote constraints. Pardon me? You provoke constraints, they, they, they sort of talk about the solar cell. Right, well, the solar cell might be a non permode constraint because you might get able to gather power even if you are not sleeping. It, but yeah, if you have a physical device that cannot gather power while not sleeping, then you have a permode type of uh, power constraint. It, basically, the solar cell is like a negative power constraint. You know, you, you subtract off. So power. what I mean, like, if, if you have a constraint, less energy that you can use as a relay, you know, you might want to, depending on the channel, depending on what you're trying to optimize, outage, you know, probability, capacity, mm -hmm. and so forth. But for rates, yeah, I, I think your intuition is probably right. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? About so when you say the destination doesn't know M2, does that mean the source knows M2? Well, I'm, in the strategies I'm going to show you, yes, the source will know M2. In fact, it's going to control it. So the source is actually going to control the relay completely in the strategies I'm going to talk about next. Okay. So let me go on to the information theory. So the type of, I'd, I'd like to speak about one kind of strategy. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with information theory for relay channels, perhaps the most important paper to look at um, both from a historical perspective and for the theory it contains is a paper by Covert that Cover and El Gamal published in the Information Theory Transactions in 1979, which is a, contains very, I think, deep and fundamental concepts about relay channels. And the strategy I'm going to explain to you now is one of the, one of the two basic strategies in that paper. And this type of strategy is now uh, popularly known as a decode and forward strategy. And what the decode the forward refers to is that the relay first decodes all of the message before the destination does. And it turns out that the rates you can achieve with this kind of strategy, I've, sh I've shown that here. So let me explain, just try to explain that in a quick way first before getting into the details. What happens is we have a minimum of two mutual information. The first mutual information represents the bound on how quickly we can get a message from here to here. Remember, we've assumed that decode and forward strategies have the relay decoding before the destination. So I think it's natural to have here in the bound a mutual information between here and the output, but conditioned on what terminals who knows, because it can subtract off any effect it, it has on the input. Okay, so that's for this link. That, that's for this hop, if you like. That's that bound. And then at a second stage, what happens is that terminal one and two cooperate to transmit information jointly to terminal three. And that's represented here by this mutual information. So it's like a multi-antenna kind of effect. But what's remarkable about their strategy is two things. First of all, that while you are transmitting information to here, you're simultaneously piggybacking new information onto here, number one. So, so both of these appear without like a factor half or something to, if you want to timeshare a scheme like this. It's happening at the same time. And number two, you can optimize this minimum of mutual information over all joint input distributions. So if coherent combining is possible through channel knowledge, you can do it. Or through these strategies, it's, it's possible to do it. Uh, I'll show you in, in the next two or, two or three slides how, how one can achieve this. Like to give you really the details of the idea of how this stuff works. Um, but just to add, there's also a um, natural, well, natural, once you see it, it's natural, but uh, there's, an, there's an upper bound on the capacity, and that 
corresponds to what's called the cut set bound. So what you can do in, in networking theory, if you have a network like this, the natural thing to do is to cut the source from the destination. And here we can do this in two ways. Here's a cut and here's a cut. And this type of bound, this type of uh, um, approach also works more generally to conditional probability distributions. And the type of bound you get is you take look at both cuts and you minimize over the mutual information for this cut. If we look at this cut first, we have the mutual information of the input on this side, and then we assume everyone on the other side can cooperate. So we have the mutual information between here and all the outputs on this side, given what this side knows, which is x2. All right. And then for this cut, we do the same thing. The mutual information between the inputs on the transmit side, the output, and the outputs on the receive side, even what the receive side knows. And that's this. And, and one can prove, and it's not actually not too terribly difficult to, sh to show this, that the capacity is upper bounded by that quantity. And if you look at these two, well, this is the same. Uh, there's one difference is that here a Y3 enters also. That's one difference between the two. And that's what causes these two these two quantities, these two numbers here, to be different in general. So the next thing I'd like to do is explain to you how you can achieve this kind of scheme, uh, this kind of rate. And um, uh, the, the strategy I'm going to show you is a little bit different than the one Cover and Al Gamal proposed in their paper. And the reason for that is their, their scheme is a little bit more difficult to explain and involves more complicated theory. In subsequent years, there were two people who simplified the strategy down, but still achieved the same rate. And, and in do, in so doing, they made it much more practical, I think. So the two people are, uh, number one, Carlisle, who was a student of Covers in the mid-70s and uh, works in Brazil right now. I think the space agency or something involved with the space agency in Brazil. And um, Franz Willems, who's a professor at the Eindhoven in the Netherlands. And they code as, as I'm showing here. And the way it works is as follows. Um, since you have a relay transmitting and the source transmitting, there's two code books, or two types of code books. There's a code book at the relay, which has size 2 to the nr, where r is the rate that we're trying to transmit, and it has length n. And I've enumerated here the code words in the code book from 1 to 2 to the nr. Then for every code word in this code book of the relay, we superpose, in quotation marks, on top of that, or we associate with every code word here, another 2 to the nr code word for the source. And I've enumerated this. The first number represents the number here. It's the sound <coughs> number here. And the second number represents uh, which uh, message the source is transmitting. So basically, we have a code book and then tons of code books. One code book for every code word in the original code book. So lots of code words floating around here. Uh, what's interesting about this is that both this code book and this code book are the same size. That's one thing. And the way, the way you can think of transmission now is as follows. Suppose we look at the first block of transmission. So we're going to transmit in several blocks. In the first block, the relay knows nothing. So it will choose a default code word, say code word 1. The source is trying to transmit a message to the relay. So it, it chooses one of these code words, say the third one, and transmits this off to the relay. And by assumption on how the codes are constructed, the relay can decode this message. And the source knows this. So the source knows or assumes that the relay has decoded number three. The relay takes number three and just sends next its third code word. The source knows the relay is transmitting the third code word and then just looks at the code book corresponding to that third code word and picks a new message. And off we go. Now we're in steady state. Right? As long as the relay decodes correctly, we can keep doing that. So uh, the way you can actually build this, I, I said there's tons of code words floating around. It's actually a little bit simpler than what it looks. So one scheme might be to do the following. You, you might generate every code word here by choosing it as the sum of two code words from, a, from two different turbo codes, or maybe even the same turbo code. So for instance, this code book might simply be a turbo code, generated in a turbo coding fashion. And then the, the source always knows what the relay is transmitting, so it takes that code word and adds to it a code word out of another turbo code. And that's it. That's, the, that's, how, that's how the source operates. 
So you're assuming that all the nodes know the various alphas, I mean, know, know the distances, right? Uh, I'm assuming that nodes know all the distances, yes, but not the random variables, the phases, in the phases or in gen more generally even the amplitudes if you did have a relative. Yeah, so not, not yet anyway. I, actually, I haven't said anything about channel knowledge, but I'm going to assume later that only the receivers know their channels. The transmitters can find out the channel. So this, this is more abstract than that. All this construction is at the probability level. It's not yet. The probabilities haven't been made specific. They're still, still at the abstract level. So this works quite generally. And very importantly, it's going to work for half duplex devices as well as full duplex because we have a memoryless channel model for which all this theory works. It's one of the powers of information theory, right? You're, you can make these general statements using random variables before even talking about what they actually are. Right. Even Nemo channel capacity is mutual information between X and Y and the max is optimi an optimization problem. Input distribution and then encoding problem. Is that okay? So let me go to the final stage and I haven't said yet what the destination does. What does the destination do? So if, if to show you this, I can write out how the scheme evolves and I've done that in four blocks. So in block one, the relay transmits a default cohort. The destination at the source chooses the same index here and chooses a new message. The relay decodes this, chooses the corresponding code word. The source uses the same index here, chooses a new message. And so the messages bubble through the network until the final stage where we don't send a new message. So we've reduced the rate by a factor of three quarters, of course. We've sent a new message only in the first three blocks, but if that gets long enough, that effect will go away that block. Now the decoding scheme that I want to talk about here is actually due to Tom Cover's students. Uh, I guess I sh shouldn't say it that way. He's been working for very many years <laughs> on many other problems. You're one student forever. Right? Yeah, yeah, I guess that's how it works, right? <laughs> yeah, you can never get away from that. So um, what, what the receiver does, it does not decode message W1 after the first block, but it decodes it only after the second block. And the important thing is it does so by using a joint decoder. So it, it uses its outputs it's received from this block, its outputs it's received from this block to do, to do a decoding of W1. And the way you can think of this works is because you're joint decoding, you get two contributions. You get one mutual information contribution from this block and one information, mutual information contribution from this block. If we look at this block, you'll see, well, wait, we don't know what W2 is and we're not interested in what that is. So you can view X1 as being pure interference for the receiver. Whereas we are running over different W1s in our decoder. So from this block, we get a contribution of the mutual information between X2 and Y3. But X1 doesn't appear in here, it's pure interference. It's like no. Then if we look at this block, we know what X2 is, so we should put it in the conditioning, and the rest is just the mutual information between X1 and the output, given what we know. And if we sum these two together, and we can do that, you can show that by theory, if you, as long as you use joint decoding, uh, you can sum those two together, and you get this joint mutual information. Okay. So, basically this shows how the scheme works, both in terms of encoding and decoding at the receiver. And I, I would like to point out that this, so fundamentally, um, you can count three additions to traditional multi-hopping in the scheme. So by traditional multi-hopping, I mean that the source transmits, say, a certain fraction of the time, say half the time to the relay, and then the relay sends half the time to the destination, something like this. Uh, the three additions are, number one, we're permitting the terminals to transmit at the same time if they want to. Number two, we are permitting coherent combining, but in order to do this, we have to get synchronization. And number three, probably uh, the most important one, I think, the receiver should try to decode given all its past information, not only its most recent block. That's one place where most of the things come from. Okay, any questions about that? That's the strategy. Um, so if we look at, suppose we now consider our uh, fixed swap strategies again. Um, 
and we simply apply what the rates we had. Well, for the fixed plot strategies, everyone knows what the mode was. So basically, what you do is you put the mode into the conditioning everywhere. Right. This, so this mutual information will just be an average over all modes of the the mutual information we already had from the, for the link from the source to the relay. And this mutual information will be the mutual information we already had for the joint transmission from the source to the relay to the destination. And we can choose any joint distribution on the mode and the two inputs. Okay. And you can show here that Gaussian input distributions, probably not surprisingly, are best with fading, with random channel parameters or without. And you can also show, and I'm not going to get into details of that, something called a partial decode and forward strategy performs better. Partial decode and forward refers to the fact that the relay does not decode all of the message, but maybe only part of it. But I'm not going to get into the details of that. Uh, this, this, this strategy, the decode and forward strategy, where the relay decodes everything already, will show the concepts that I want to show. Okay. So let me do a numerical example to show you what kind of games are possible. So suppose we consider the following situation. We have a source. Here, the relay is, say, on the line between the source and destination at a distance of d to the right of the source, and the destination is a distance of 1 to the right of the source. So here I've written out the model. The output here is the gain from here to here plus noise. The output here is the sum from this one and this one plus noise. And you see here, right now I'm looking at a full duplex model with this. Um, uh, or the, this, this definition here is the, is the full duplex definition. And if we add that y3, uh, y2 prime, do we have the half duplex model? Uh, recall the two fading models. I think you'll remember that. And uh, just as an addition about channel knowledge, I'm going to assume for simplicity, because the theory is the easiest here, suppose that the channel the games, the random games, are not known at the transmitting terminals, but are known to the receiving terminals. It's like, sort of like a training situation, if you like. You send training symbols, but you have no fast feedback to send that data back. And if this is so, you can model the full channel outputs by putting the, for instance, at the destination, you, 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 the full channel output is the Y, as well as the two uh, games, half games, at that time. Okay, uh, next page, I, I'd like to discuss two examples. I'm going to show two plots. Uh, there's a whole bunch of parameters associated with both. The main difference is the first case is no fading, and the second case is phase fading. Attenuation exponent is four for both, and there are various power constraints, which don't play such a crucial role. So let's consider no fading first. So we have the following plot. On the x-axis, I have the distance. So for instance, d equals 0. So the source is at 0. The destination is 1, is at 1. So d equals 0 means the relay is co-located with the source. d equals 1 means the relay is co-located with the destination. And d equals 0 0.5 means it's halfway in between. And negative means it's on the other side of the source. And on the y-axis, I have the rate and bits per use. This dotted line shows the rate you can achieve without a relay. And the other curves show what you can achieve with different strategies. The green dotted curve shows rates attainable with traditional multi-hopping, where I'm optimizing over the fraction of time the source transmits, and the relay transmits, as well as optimizing over power control. Um, then, uh, subject to the constraints, of course, the other curves show you that there's two other curves I want to point out now. The red one shows you what the decode and forward strategy achieves with fixed with fixed spot constraints, or is it with deterministic, or deterministic spot structure. And the blue curve shows you the cut set bound under the assumption that you have a fixed spot structure. And if you look here, you'll see, well, OK, um, this decode and forward achieves only the same rate as no relay if the relay is at the same place as destination. Of course, it makes sense because we're forcing the relay to code. Of course, we can only achieve the same thing as if the relay is off. So you see, you get a reasonable gain in rate for all the positions, unless we get close to the destination. This really is close to the destination, as opposed to multi-hopping with, with the decoding forward speed. It's a reasonable gain. So this is with half. This is all with half duplex uh, devices. 
What happens to the blue for about three cups? Paul is the red cup? Uh, with, oh, yes, here Paul is the red cup, yes. So this, yeah. is, this is the cut set bound when the four are fixed. I guess my question was the black curve. Uh, the black curve, yes. Yeah. Well, I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> but just give me a second. So I want to. I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Here's the same types of curves for phase fading. Everything just changes a little bit because I've changed the constraints. But the, the important thing to see again is so that the decoded forward is the magenta curve and then it's the red curve and then the magenta curve. Again, you get reasonable gains over traditional multi-hopping in certain regimes. In other regimes, you shouldn't be using the decoded forward for this industry. Okay, so uh, um, as Frederick pointed out, there are some other curves here and they lie above the cut set bound. And how can that happen? And let me explain that. And those are for the random spot strategies. And to explain this effect, uh, I'd like to explain it as follows. Um, first of all, the explanation for what's happening there is really that a fixed spot strategy imposes, is, is really an artificial constraint for these kinds of devices. You shouldn't do this to maximize rate. You might do it to simplify, but not to maximize rate. And uh, to understand this effect, uh, I'm going to use the memoryless channel model without any assumption about the coding structure ahead of time. So suppose I just take our model. Okay, I can use this. But I'm going to use the abstraction I mentioned, that I mentioned just here. Suppose I do the following. Suppose I make the input a vector of the relay, which consists of both the actual input and the mode. And I'm also going to change the input alphabet of the relay to be either sleep or zero, listen or zero, or talk, or, and the complex numbers, right? So it's just an abstraction. Everything stays, doesn't, nothing changes here. And then the channel is just, uh, just add the constraint that the output of the relay is zero if the mode is either sleep or talk. And then I can add costs on this input vector, both uh, power costs and say uh, time, co time costs. That's how often you sleep, sleep, or talk. Okay, and here comes the information theory comparison. The advantage now is we, we haven't made any assumption. I'm just going to plug this stuff into the equations and see what comes out. So recall that for a given input distribution of the mode and the two inputs, the fixed slot strategy achieved this rate. The M2 is in the conditioning in both cases. But suppose we just take our new channel, recall that the rate we should be able to achieve with the going forward looks like this, right? We have the x1, y2 given x, all of x2, x1, x2, y3. I'm just going to replace the vector with x2, m2, this vector also with x2, m2. Uh, and then using the chain rule for mutual information, I can write this as i, m2, y3, plus i, x1, x2, y3 given m2. And I say, well, wait, okay, this looks the same as this, this looks the same as this, but lo and behold, I have a boost in rate. And moreover, that number is usually positive. And in fact, this is sort of exactly how I noticed this in the first place. I changed the model to remember the model plugged it in and went, wait a minute, how can that be? <laughs> and, and then when you think about it for a while, you realize, well, wait, just by plugging it, the stuff directly into the information theory, you get a new strategy, namely that you can actually transmit information through the mode, through the timing. If the destination does not know the timing, there's extra randomness in the system that you can use. Again, Random, if anywhere there's randomness, you can transmit information. If there's not, you can't. So that's why I'm saying that, that the fixed plot strategy really imposes an artificial constraint on these devices. But, but you assume that both the source and the relay know uh, the, the source is controlling what the relay is doing. So it's transmitting information through controlling what the relay is doing. If it can, if it can help transmission by turning that thing on and off at random, right. it'll do that. So does the source use information to modulate M2. Yes, it does. In the code book, which was chosen for the relay, M2 is part of that code book. Yeah. So some of the information is in the time. Is in the time. That's right. You're transmitting information through the time. <coughs> is the extra capacity that you get more than the extra... Okay, that's good. Right, that's the interesting question, right? Should you do this for all cases? So I'll give you an example in just a second. Let, let, let me just make, make one, uh, I'll show you this on the next page, an example, which I hopefully make this quite explicit. 
Um, so you can transmit information through the mode. You sh I, should, I want to make one remark. It's not a lot. It's at most one bit per use, right? There's only three modes, and two of them are basically equivalent, right? Yeah. Uh, both, if the relay sweeps and lifts, it transmit zero in both cases. Uh, moreover, there's some other points, practical points here that must be made. First of all, in most devices, you can't switch that fast, right? So you should add uh, run length limited constraints, that kind of stuff, to your um, timing transmission. Now, uh, also, one bit isn't enough much at high SMR, but at low SMR, it might be reasonable yeah, to keep in mind. And, and most of these many devices that people are looking at today are operating at low SMR, at least in terms of the cheap devices. Yeah. Of course, at low SNR, you won't be able to get that full bit across. <laughs> but, but, but still, there's an extra boost that potentially is there. So let me show you show you a very simple example, which I hope will convince you. It will, it will sort of explain to you how this can work. Suppose we consider it's the following. Suppose this stuff all applies not only to wireless, but also to wired networks. So suppose we have the following case. A wired network, a very simple one a relay, right? So suppose you have a fiber optic cable and another fiber optic cable. And suppose that the edges are noiseless. Suppose, moreover, this router or whatever that device is doing has a node constraint. Suppose it can't transmit and receive at the same time. Maybe it's overloaded if it's doing too much on both lengths. So it can listen or talk. Uh, so what we have here in the model is that Y3 is X2 and Y2 is X1 as long as X2 is zero. So I'm going to make this really, really simple. I'm going to assume both inputs are bits, and that Y3 is X2, but Y2 is X1 as long as X2 is 0, but 0 if X2 is not equal to 0. Again, I'm permitting this router to switch really fast at, at, at the same rate as the symbol. Now, I guess that most people, I've seen, I've seen this, uh, people look at networks like this and they say, well, the capacity is half, right? Half the time you should transmit from the source to the destination, the other half you should transmit from the, uh, the relay to the destination. But if we just plug in our, uh, plug in, uh, look at our equation, we say, well, wait, uh, the rate is the minimum between the mutual with the code and forward between x1, y2, and x2, and x1, x2, y3. And you, you kind of guess that the code and forward is optimal here, right? <laughs> it's, you know, maybe not, but you kind of guess it. So if we write this out, we have the entropy of y2 given x2 minus the entropy of y2 given these two, but that's just zero, right? So we get this entropy. And then we have the entropy of y3 minus the entropy of y3 given this. So we have the entropy of y3, but y3 is just x2, so we get h of x2. If you look at this equation, you, you, I think you'll be able to convince yourself, especially here, y2 is a function of x1 and x2, but the best thing to do is just to choose x1 statistically independent of x2. It doesn't matter what we're doing there. As long as we code carefully, we'll be able to get the corresponding information across. So we'll do that. So in that case, I can write this out like this, right? If x2 is 0, and I choose this thing here to be uniform, then I'm getting all of x1 across, right? So I get 1. So I get properly the x2 is 0 times the entropy of y2 given x2 is 0, which is 1. If x2 is 1, uh, if, if x2 is not 0, or it's 1, then of course this is a constant, so I get 0 entropy. So this quantity is just the probability that x2 is 0. And the entropy of x2, well, that's just the binary entropy function of the probability x2 is 0. So what you have now is, well, you can just draw it out. So we're trying to look at the minimum between, so this is p of x2 equals 0. And this here is h of p x2 of 0. So we have this curve. That's the binary entropy function at 1. And we have the line. And you have to look at where it crosses. And it happens to cross at 0.773. Right. And so I'm getting a reasonable boost in rate, about, well, 50%, over 50% more rate, by not using the natural strategy, but sending information through timing. So all this theory doesn't only apply to wireless, it applies to wireline networks as well with node constraints. And many practical networks, the routers, they do have node constraints. Of course, qualify that, the alphabets are usually not bits, they're usually packets, right? And if you if you start making this alphabet really big, then the amount of extra information you can get through timing becomes very small as opposed to what you can send directly. But the main point I'd like to make is just there is more potential there than using deterministic flux strategies. Okay.
I'm, 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 I'm still yeah. a little puzzled. You're yeah. assuming here that you now have an additional channel between terminal one and terminal two for terminal one to let terminal two whether to sleep uh, transmit or it's not an additional channel. I'm, in the information I'm transmitting from here to here, it's included. It, the source tells the relay when it should turn on and off. Okay, but how, what, uh, how does it tell it? Yeah, in, in a code. It's part of the code. It's part of the, um, it's part of the message. It's, it's part of the code book, if you like. I mean, it, it, it's actually very interesting to think of how you could build now a code that does this. And in fact, what you can do Everything's noiseless. You can actually build a source coder here. Actually, uh, you, you, what you should do is build something like a Tunstall code or a Huffman code and then decode it. It, it, it. it would take me a little bit to get into details. I could do that and I'd probably add a slide next time I give this talk to show you the strategy you can use here. This guy can just transmit zeros and ones, but it should transmit messages only when it knows this guy is listening, right? But since it's but it's zero, and but since it's zero point seven seven three of the time, it can transmit point seven seven three bits across. So what remains is for this guy to send information commonly through the timing and what it can get directly through and appropriately. And you can show that you can do that with uh, Tunstall codes or Huffman codes or uh, with arithmetic coding techniques. Because this guy has to turn on and off with this fraction. So what you can do is actually kind of neat strategies for which you can do this. You have a line between 0 and 1. You divide it at 0 0.773. And that's the T and 7, I'm sorry. 773. Um, and um, then what you do is this guy decodes, gets a string of bits, let's say 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. This has a binary. You put a, a dot here, right? So you have a decimal. You map that onto a point. And if that point lies to the left of this line, you transmit a 0 out here. Otherwise, you transmit a 1, and you just keep dividing. And the destination knows what's going on, and so it can undo that. But you can actually use source codes to, to actually do this. Pretty, you know, kind of use source coding ideas to, to get this, actually really achieve this uh, gain from half to 0.7. You have to be a little more sophisticated than just uh, uh, doing the simplest thing. A little bit more sophisticated. Not much more sophisticated. You guys all know how this stuff works. So. Taken in here. Another way to look at it is the relay is just going to turn on until it can decode that message. For the first block. And then for the second block, the source knows when the relay is off, and during those times, yeah. it can pass on a bit. During the other times, it can't. It just gets quiet. All right, so this link is easy to do, but this link is a little, requires a little more sophistication. So, and these kinds of, you know, even the schemes I talked about in terms of the source coding, I think, you know, they apply to wireless or wireline. In this particular case, it's wireline networks. Okay, I think I've taken too long. I was, I was going to say something about, well, maybe I'll just summarize. I was going to say something about synchronization yet, and I wanted to convince you that you don't need to, if you have phase fading, including rally fading, for instance, then you don't need to they synchronize, that's clear, but you also don't need to symbol synchronize either. Well, you have time. And you can go back to the slides to show us the effect of the... Oh, uh, oh well, I, I guess I could do that. Yeah. So, flat the, so let's look at the phase phase case, I suppose. So the games, so the, now we're back in the wireless domain, not wireless, wireline, wireless. Um, and you can show that if the relay is in some region about the source, by using timing, using this idea, you can actually boost the rate beyond the cut set bound for a fixed slot strategy and you get the black curve. So what I've done to go from red to black is I've taken the same distribution. Oh, I'm sorry, I have it. Oh yeah. I've taken the same distribution I've used for the fixed slot strategy and I've just taken the same one and plugged it into the new equation to get the black curve. But what's interesting now oops, went the wrong way, is that so this is, this is conditionally Gaussian, the red, conditionally Gaussian on the mode. This is conditionally Gaussian. Uh, it turns out Gaussian distributions aren't inputs aren't optimal anymore as soon as you use timing. And one way of sort of seeing this is in a memoryless sense is what the relay is transmitting if you have the signal set. So this is the real the complex. So suppose we have a modulate, a QPSK set. The relay actually has another point, a 
at which it must transmit, namely zero, certain fraction of the time. So in a memoryless sense, what you have is a new constellation. And if you want to do a Gaussian shape, suppose we want to do Gaussian, so we don't we have a continuum now of points, right? You know, if you look at it as in 3D, uh, but there's also there's always still this Dirac delta sitting at zero. And because of that constraint of that Dirac delta sitting at zero, it turns out using Gaussian for the other points isn't optimal anymore. And in fact, I, I'm pretty sure, I have no proof of this yet, but I'm pretty sure that the optimum input distribution will be discrete and finite, which is a common case. As soon as Gaussianity breaks down, it breaks down, the continuity breaks down, you actually go to discrete. Um, not so important practically, I think, but, but from a theoretical perspective, and maybe for some practical problems, it's interesting. So what I, what I want to say with that, too, is I can't draw the actual cut set bound here <laughs> with, with, with the, the new channel, because I don't know how to compute it, because I don't know how to optimize the input distribution. You see. So I don't know, probably this magenta curve isn't quite at capacity yet, but I kind of suspect that decoding forward does achieve capacity when the relay is near the source, just like it does it, the cut set bound is met for it when the relay is in a certain regime around the source. And I, I think it happens here too, but one has to prove it. And it's not easy to prove because you can't explicitly write out the optimum input distribution, but I think you can prove it eventually. I think it's possible without finding the optimum input distribution. Any questions about that? Uh, I don't know if I should say anything about synchronization. Mm -hmm. We have time to grab for it. Yeah. Okay, it's not going to take too long. It'll take about a couple of minutes. Uh, so, uh, recap before I get into this thing. Um, one main point I want to make with all this is random strategies are needed to harness the full potential of half duplex relays. It may, I mean, it may not be practical. It, the gains may be too small for most systems to be able to, to be useful. I don't know that. Um, but from a theoretical perspective, gains are achievable. I don't know what happens with outage probability. I don't know what happens with diversity and you know, all this stuff uh, that starts coming in. Okay, and I wrote here one potential application, if it is useful, is that at least one should take into account modes that are switched at random to communicate. Because for most things like sensor networks, you do have half duplex devices after all. Uh, there's many open problems. I mentioned a few. What is the optimal input distribution for decoding forward? What is the optimal input distribution for cut set bound for top duplex relays? And I wrote here, yeah, best distribution likely has an infinite number of discrete now. And amplitude mass points, I don't know that though. Um, and there's a little bit of cryptic remark, but the gamma too refers to constraints on the list in the book. So, some extensions. Well, this stuff all extends to rally fading, it all extends to multiple antennas, different kinds of fading. Uh, multiple user systems too, right? We have networks with half-duplex devices and more than one terminal trying to transmit. Well, you can use these ideas too. It's quite general concept. Uh, synchronization. What about synchronization? Okay. So, if we have no fading, the, these gains here, this is no fading. To get these, to get this boost from relay off up to here, we were using the fact that coherent combining was possible. Now, of course, here, with phase fading, coherent binding combining is not possible because the transmitters don't know the phase to begin with. So certainly you don't need to phase synchronize the source and the relay if there is phase fading. You do if there is, um, you do need to synchronize them if there's no phase fading and you want to, and you want to get that gain. But um, more, no, you, don't even, you, you need not only phase synchronization without fading, you also need symbol synchronization get the coherent gains. And neither of these, phase or symbol sync, is likely easy to attain in wireless systems, right? Uh, unless you have pretty fast feedback or unless you have a fixed wireless type of situation. Well, I'd like to know, is the same true with phase fading? Well, certainly you don't need phase sync, but do we need symbol sync for these strategies? It's a very important practical question, I think. And my claim is that no, we don't. As long as the input distribution we are optimizing over has statistically <coughs> independent inputs, which isn't necessarily optimal for half duplex relays anymore, by the way. It's not clear. I don't know if that's true. But for many cases, that's already good enough. Usually we'll use Gaussians anyway, but okay, these are all subtleties. Suppose then that we have phase fading and we have statistically independent input distributions that we're optimizing over. My claim
claims, I don't need to simple synchronize the transmitters. Of course, we need to simple synchronize other speaker, but we don't need to simple synchronize the transmitters. And the idea is the following. With phase fading, if the two input distributions that we're choosing are independent, then we may as well, you can show this, um, transmit using a scheme like this. We simply hop the message to the relay, and the relay, and then um, hop the message to the relay, but we don't have both one, we don't have here, say, both W1 and W2, right? So we're not trying to perform coherent combining. This doesn't mean we're at multi-hopping again. Remember, both guys can transmit at the same time, and the, re the receiver is using all past information to decode. Okay, so it's not, it's more sophisticated than traditional multi-hopping again. Uh, so when I, when I think of traditional multi-hopping, I, I mean that we have a half complex device. The transmitter, say, sends one third of the time the uh, message to the relay. Uh, the transmitter turns off. The relay hops the that's sort of the, I think, the standard multi-hopping scheme. But you, in, the, in your multi-hopping code, you optimize for any possible time where it could be on. Yes, I'm, and I'm even doing extra power control that I'm not permitting in the decoding forward, because that's, I don't want to, yeah, so that I'm permitting more, even. So, and you still get these. Right. So here's my justification of this claim. Uh, what you can do, really we have to worry about the destination. So the destination, remember, is decoding W1 using these two blocks. But remember, it's viewing this as interference. So what it does is it looks at the delay between the relay and itself and interpolates this block of outputs according to this delay, the delay from this guy. But, but, but if you look carefully at band-limited signals, if I take any band-limited signal that acts as interference and I shift it, its interference power doesn't change. And even if I shift a little bit or a lot, it, its interference power doesn't change. As long as I don't shift it completely out of the window I'm looking at. And that's important because what that means is I can simply interpolate here according to the delay between the relay and destination. And similarly here, well here the, um, the destination already no knows what the relay transmitted, so it can subtract it off. So it certainly can simply uh, interpolate that signal, the interference free signal, according to the de delay between the source and itself. And in so doing, we'll get the same mutual information. So as long as we have phase fading, number one, and number two, um, we have statistically independent inputs, then I can get the same rates I just showed you, even though the transmitted signals are not symbol synchronized. In fact, they can be off by quite a bit, right? Like a, like a symbol and a half or three and a half symbols, as long as it isn't like half a block or something like that. And even then I can do it, <laughs> actually, because I'm viewing this simply as interference. Okay, that's my hand waving justification. And so the next step is to actually do a simulation with this, and, and but I'm sure it'll work. It's pretty clear it will work, I think. Did I convince you? Okay. So are you saying like uh, different shifts correspond to different phase fittings? That is that the idea? Uh, different time shifts. Time shifts are yeah. correspond to different phase yeah. fittings, and uh, irrespective of that shift, phase fitting the power is still the same. So the yeah. understanding yeah. of the time shift. The power the will still power be the same. same yeah. since it's being given yeah. it doesn't matter. That's right. So if I take any block of symbols and say we go negative infinity plus infinity at some finite length, I shift it by say half a symbol uh, by interpolation. So I use an interpolator and I measure the power on the signals, it will remain the same. Because it's a band limited signal. Yeah. But it has to be band limited. That's important here. But most signals, you know, are approximately that anyway. So that's my justification for the claim. Uh, I have more. I never get to talk about this, but multi-message networks, so something I'm working on together with uh, Lolita. Um, Multi-access relay channels where you have many sources and one destination and then relays in between. Uh, also something the opposite is like a broadcasting case where we have one source trying to transmit with the help of relay messages to two destinations. The theory is it's quite interesting and evolved for these problems and there's still much open ground. Um, so to summarize uh, the final slide, uh, decoding forward, I talked about strategies, uh, achieves capacity for some practical wireless relay problems, including half duplex cases. Um, 
With phase painting, uh, the final point I made is that for band limited signals, if independent inputs are optimal, then no phase or simple synchronization is needed. Uh, at, at terminal uh, transmitter synchronization, of course, receiver sync is only to sync your receiver. Uh, number three, random slot strategies improve rates for half duplex devices. Uh, number four, the techniques generalized to multi source networks, multi antenna channels, different kinds of paving. And for more details, uh, there is two papers. This is a far too long. You don't want to read that. I don't know. <laughs> I said it's a very long paper. Uh, this one here discusses in detail the, uh, really only the half duplex part of the talk. So you can choose if you are interested. But I'd be happy to talk with you about it if you're interested. So thank you for your attention. And I'm sorry I went uh, over by.